I make lots of videos about Catholicism on this YouTube channel, and I want to thank you for subscribing, by the way. In some of my videos, I compare and contrast Catholic stuff with Protestant stuff. That's a very deep theological term, by the way. And I love and appreciate everyone who comments on my videos, especially those of you who share really long messages, who don't feel confined to the topic of my video, and who let me know in Christian love that I am a heretic, headed for hell, an idolater, a deceiver, and that I am stupid and have dumb hair. I also appreciate those of you who use all caps out of consideration for my aging eyes. You guys are the best. But seriously though, there are times when I make a video describing the differences between Protestants and Catholics where someone objects because my description of Protestantism doesn't apply to them. That's not what I believe, they may say. And the best example I've seen of this on my channel has been in the responses to the video I made called Once Saved, Always Saved is Garbage. Many say, well, I'm a Protestant and I agree with you, Keith. Others have said, well, those Protestants are not actual Protestants. Real Protestants believe this or that. What's interesting about this is often that the objector thinks that this fact vindicates them or somehow bolsters their position against Catholicism. I never see it that way. I see it as a big fat problem. The big fat Protestant problem is that Protestantism has no formal universal definition. Now we Catholics need to understand this because we must avoid the trap of lumping all those different groups of people who identify as Protestants together. They are anything but united. Now some are closer than others, but some are miles apart and wouldn't even consider the others Christians. But what unites them all is that they aren't Catholic. But that doesn't mean they necessarily have much else in common, except for one thing. They all believe in Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone is their infallible rule of faith. They don't have to listen to any church authority or Pope's teaching. They just open God's word and the Holy Spirit shows them the truth. You know, something just occurred to me here. When they say the Holy Spirit revealed the truth to them, they aren't really practicing Sola Scriptura, are they? Is the Holy Spirit the same thing as the Bible? If they say yes, then they must admit that the Holy Spirit is not eternal. Or do they believe that the Bible is another form of the incarnation? This is an interesting idea. I may have to look into this. But here's the deal. If that were true, things would look a lot different in the world of Sola Scriptura Protestantism. The Holy Spirit would never lead people to contradictory conclusions. So how do we account for this? Where has it led? And is it a good thing? At the time of the Reformation, Luther and other reformers like Ulrich Zwingli believed that to topple the Catholic Church truly, they needed to be united. And I'm going to quote briefly from an article on the Desiring God blog by Michael Haken. He's a Baptist theological professor, and he writes this. The German ruler Philip of Hesse, who had embraced the convictions of the Reformation, was deeply concerned that division among the reformers would jeopardize the political future of the Reformation. He was concerned that Roman Catholic princes would seek to exploit this division to politically roll back the advance of the reform. Philip thus arranged for a meeting to take place at his castle in Marburg, Germany in the fall of 1529, which he hoped would heal the division between the two Reformation giants. When Zwingli and Luther met, it was an explosive meeting that failed to unite the two Christian leaders. Ultimately, Luther refused to recognize the Swiss reformer as a genuine Christian, and thus their division remained unhealed. After the meeting, Luther concluded that Zwingli was a, quote, perverted man who had no part of Christ and was, quote, seven times worse than when he was a papist. That's a big insult. Now, they agreed on much, but what drove them apart was their differing views on the Eucharist. Luther held to a more literal interpretation of Jesus' words, this is my body while Zwingli argued that this was purely symbolic. Why is this so important? Because at the beginning of the Reformation, the leaders all understood that they needed to be united or else this entire exercise would result in a circus with anyone and everyone coming to their own theological conclusions and starting their own churches. And the thing is, they knew this was bad. They understood Jesus' prayer in John 17 that his followers should be one. They understood the need for unity and authority. They just believed it was better with them than with Rome. And their greatest fear was that their attempts to reform the church would devolve into mass chaos. 
and those fears have more than come true. Today, there are entire Protestant denominations that bear Luther's name that have abandoned much of his theology. For example, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America ordains women and openly practicing homosexuals. The Presbyterian Church of the USA does the same, and they both trace their roots back to Calvin and Zwingli and Luther. But it's not just the liberal mainline denominations that have departed from the teaching of the Reformers. The Anabaptists denied baptismal regeneration and infant baptism, and they were persecuted and killed by other Protestants. So most Baptists today have a theology that would make Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli roll over in their graves. Luther didn't believe in once saved, always saved, but Calvin did. And they both believed that Mary was a perpetual virgin, by the way. I don't know any other Protestant denomination that teach that. I could go on and on with examples of Protestants disagreeing with each other. And they often don't realize that their division reveals the incredible problem with what they have in common, Sola Scriptura, and the rejection of the Catholic Church's authority. Now, I know many will say, no, the problem is that those liberals actually deny Sola Scriptura because if they went by Sola Scriptura, they wouldn't hold those heretical liberal views. But that statement assumes that they alone have discovered the truth and all others who claim Sola Scriptura but disagree with them are frauds. Now, honestly, I can see that when it comes to the extreme liberals. But what about the extreme conservative groups like the independent fundamentalist Baptists? Go tell Pastor Steven Anderson that he doesn't really practice Sola Scriptura and see what happens. Does John MacArthur say that R.C. Sproul didn't practice Sola Scriptura because he, like Luther, believed in infant baptism? Are the Reformed Baptists going to claim that Calvin himself, who, like I said earlier, taught Mary's perpetual virginity, wasn't a Sola Scriptura Christian? Do you see where this leads? Who gets to define this term and judge others by it? How do you know who really is practicing Sola Scriptura when there is no official universal authority on the matter? If Sola Scriptura was God's plan, then why has it led to mass chaos and confusion? I once had someone try to make the case to me that all of these differing versions of Protestant Christianity are actually a good thing because we can reach more people with the gospel due to our stylistic differences and preferences. But there's a vast difference between a stylistic difference and a theological contradiction. And there's also an inability to solve disputes that come up, to practice church discipline and settle theological questions. And these were mandates given to the church by Jesus. And none of them are workable under this modern day Sola Scriptura Protestantism whatever that is. And that, my friends, is a big fat Protestant problem. Thanks for watching. God bless.